Hey everyone, Eric here. Very quickly before we get to the show, just want to give you an update on all the new things we've got going on at CAP. We've got some new staff on board who are producing some amazing daily coverage of China-Africa issues and what's going on specifically in the Chinese discourse in China. Now, this isn't the propaganda stuff I'm talking about. Instead, what we're doing here is providing you with the translations and analysis of all the conversations that are taking place on Chinese social media, new research papers, think tank reports, and lots and lots of primary source material. This is the kind of thing that's just not available on Twitter or in mainstream news coverage. Plus, we've got a lot more Middle East, North Africa coverage now available on the site, and we'll be expanding our focus to other regions in the Global South in the months ahead. So if you're interested in what China's doing in Africa, the Middle East, and the Global South, you'll definitely want to subscribe. We've made it super easy and really affordable at just $7 a month for students and teachers and $15 a month for everyone else. Try it out free for 30 days. See if you like it. You'll get full access to the website. You'll get the newsletter. Just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa-China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus Finstaden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we've received a few emails over the past couple of weeks with people wondering, why we're not doing two shows a week. Normally now we do two shows a week. We've kind of gone into a little bit of a summer mode. So we're down to one show. Cobus is moving house. Uh, you know, we've got a bad COVID situation out here in Vietnam that we're wrestling with. So we thought, okay, just for the month of August, we're going to dial things down. Uh, I'm sorry, July. And then into August, we're actually going to start ramping things up again in the run up to FOCAC. So Rest assured, for those of you who've reached out to us, we're very grateful that you want more of the shows, but we're taking a little bit of a break and dialing things down just for the summer. And then in August, we'll be going back to our two shows per week schedule. So look out for that. Today, we're going to be focusing on China and South Sudan. This past July 9th was the 10th anniversary of South Sudan's independence. But as we look back on the past decade, since what is effectively the youngest country in the world became fully independent and broke away from Sudan, there really isn't a lot to celebrate. Just two years after it gained its independence from Sudan, South Sudan's new president back then, Salva Kiir, accused his former deputy, Rick Machar, of trying to orchestrate a coup. Now, that then set into motion a horrifically violent civil war that's claimed at least 400,000 lives and left, uh, some estimates have it, around a third of the population displaced. Now, the first ceasefire came back in 2014, but it didn't last very long, by the way. But the good news coming out of that 2014 ceasefire is that it prompted the creation of something called IGAD, or the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, that's made up of eight regional countries, as well as the African Union, the United Nations, the European Union, the UK, the US, and China. Now, China at first glance, and this is something that is still very interesting today, doesn't seem like it fits into that group, given that Beijing is not usually seen as an international mediator, much the way that the United States, the UN, even the European Union have over the years. But take into account the fact that the Chinese state-run oil company, CNPC, which is the China National Petroleum Corporation, owns a 40% stake in South Sudan's biggest oil fields and has invested billions and billions in oil-related infrastructure. So the economic interests from the Chinese in South Sudan, as well as in Sudan, are quite intense. And it has a vested economic interest to try and help stabilize that region, not only just because of the economics of it all, but also because of China's emergence as a much bigger player in Africa since 2010s into, into the 2020s. 
And to do that, China signed on to, let's see, the international arms embargo against both warring parties. It's provided considerable aid to both sides, including now vaccines, as well as PPE and COVID relief. It's one of the few instances, and this is something that's very interesting, which we're going to get into as well, where Beijing has actually worked closely and constructively with the U.S. You know, this is highly exceptional now, but this has been one of the places where those two countries have actually put aside a lot of their other differences and collaborated in the name of the IGAD peace process. And then early on in the conflict, all the way back in 2012, China deployed its first ever contingent of combat troops to join the UN's peacekeeping operation there. But let's fast forward now all the way to the present. And China's interests in Africa have changed a lot since 2011. It's grown weary of many of the risky investments that it made back in the early stages of its engagement in Africa. It's also now diversifying its oil supplies. So it's not depending on African oil exports anywhere near as much as it did a decade ago, now that it's buying more from the Persian Gulf, from Russia, the U.S., and Brazil. So, Cobus, that's a very brief overview of what is an incredibly complicated issue, and I had to skim things, otherwise we'd be here for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, just going through the introduction. But it really kind of points to why there's an important discussion that's now underway to gauge China's interest in helping to re-energize this peace process in South Sudan that it was so instrumental in five, ten years ago, but one has to wonder if it has the appetite for it today. Yeah, I mean, this is really this is really true for China, um, especially you know, kind of as you know, as as China's responsibilities as a global actor keep growing and growing. Um, on the other hand, it's also true, I think, for for, for several of the other actors, in, you know, um, including the U.S., which which was a very strong kind of uh, supporter of of, of South Sudan, Sudanese independence originally, and you know, kind of the it's it's kind of sad outcome, you know, is is now kind of tarnish that to that kind of that process somewhat um i think you know like everyone everyone wants the south sudanese peace process to work um not least because because it's a it's not only a very young country it's a very poor country um and you know i, I think i think everyone on the continent wants it really wants it to work i think where where it really the the, the difficulty is actually making it work and particularly kind of like fi- finding ways and finding leverage to get to get the different south sudanese uh, parties on board Well, let's dive into this and find out more. And that's why we're thrilled to have back on the show again, uh, Lina Ben Abdallah, who's a well-known China-Africa scholar at Wake Forest University in North Carolina in the U.S. She's also the author of the book that came out last year, Shaping the Future of Power, Knowledge Production and Network Building in China-Africa Relations. If you haven't read that and you're listening to this show, shame on you. You have to go out and read it. It is now on the reading list of basically every China-Africa graduate class out there. It's a must read. We did a, a show on it, so go through our archives and you can find our discussion with Lena on that. Also, Lena is a non-resident senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Lena, it is wonderful to have you back on the show again. A very good morning to you in North Carolina. Good evening and good afternoon to you, Eric and Kobus. It's uh, wonderful to, to be back on the show with you. It's great. And uh, last week, listen, you and I were on a fascinating panel that explored China's role, exploring this question of re-energizing the peace process in South Sudan. Now, that event that you and I were in and that you moderated and I hosted uh, was an invite-only event, so it wasn't open to the public. But the organizers and the participants graciously allowed me to record the discussion, and we're going to play some of the highlights today to get both yours and Cobus's reactions to some of the comments. I've evenly divided the comments between Chinese perspectives and African perspectives, including some from South Sudan, which we'll get to. But I think first, before we get to the sound bites and those perspectives, it would be great if you could help us better understand China's role in South Sudan and why it's important. Just give us a very quick high-level overview, picking up on some of the points that I made in the introduction. 
Uh, yes, um, and so as you mentioned, um, uh, uh, Eric, a lot of the story of China South Sudan is a, actually a story of China balancing its engagement uh, between the north and the south, between Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, with the independence of South Sudan, there were a set of opportunities that were presented uh, to Beijing, both in terms of Chinese, um, you know, uh, companies interested in natural resources but also way beyond natural resources. South Sudan as a new country it was a country that basically needed every sort of infrastructure work possible, um, from dams to bridges to building hospitals to schools uh, to facilities to clean, uh, purify water, uh, telecommunication infrastructure, all kinds of really interesting opportunities for investments and engagement by Chinese companies. On the challenge side, um, precisely because of this independence of the South from the North, uh, China was put in this very critical position that needed to always balance its interest uh, uh, in the North and in the South. And that was a very critical position. Obviously, China's oil interests lied in the South, but uh, diplomatically, history of, of relations and all kinds of other investments going on with the North sort of put China in this kind of really uh, very critical uh, position. And there was the challenge came uh, towards the beginning. It, the challenge came a lot from uh, both sides, the North and the South, trying to pull China in a very specific way, trying to trying to put pressure on China to negotiate more or to be in, more involved or to intervene. Um, so a lot of the last 10 years of China's engagement in South Sudan was a balancing game, was, was a walk in a very fine line between uh, uh, tapping into these opportunities that I mentioned, but also trying not to upset its relations to the North. Um, and also because of the non-interference policy or non-interference principle, which shaped a lot of China's foreign policy uh, in Africa for a long time, uh, it, there were breaks on to, uh, how much China could do. Uh, and the expectations were very high on both sides, on the north and the south, as to what China can do. But the practice of it created a lot of um, uh, perceptions of, of, of China being too reticent uh, to intervene, too passive. And so it put that challenge onto China's uh, role uh, in, in, in the area. And um, Lena, just just on, on a kind of high level, um, continuing on the same high level, um, do, 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 do you see kind of kind of measurable kind of differences or, or important differences between between the China's level of engagement and other external partners? Are, are they roughly the same, or have other external partners like ended up like showing themselves being more effective? Um, I think in South Sudan, uh, for sure, we've seen. A lot of presence of China, um, mostly because the engagement by uh, Beijing uh, in South Sudan has expanded to, like I said, um, a lot of sectors. So you see it in the agriculture sector, in the medical sector, in um, all kinds of infrastructure, in telecommunication sector. So I think because of that diversification of the different sectors, uh, it's possible to say that of all actors, uh, you can you can t t highlight or single out uh, China's involvement. And not to mention, of course, the presence of armed combat troops that are there as part of the UN peacekeeping operation. So that's a indeed that's a big one. Okay, let's start with some of the perspectives that we got during the conversation. We're going to start with Paul Nantulia, who is an old friend of the show, an old friend of yours. He's a research associate at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C. And his point that he made in, our, in the conversation was the timing of the conversation that we're having right now at this moment comes right in between two very important milestones. So in the July milestone, we have the 10th anniversary of South Sudan. But coming up in September, we have the Triennial Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit, where we are going to get the first look at the blueprint that China will have for the next three years of its engagement in Africa. And that will give us a real good indication of where it stands on issues like South Sudan. Let's take a listen to what Paul Nentuli had to say. It's timely for, for two reasons. One, uh, there's the FOCAC, the FOCAC meeting that's coming up. 
uh, which is going to be a very important uh, meeting. Uh, FOCAC is now uh, 20, 20 years old, and there'll be a lot of reflection uh, by the Chinese side and the African side in terms of where this partnership is going in future. FOCAC uh, has adopted explicitly uh, peace and security, as well as peace building, peacekeeping, and peace enforcement into its, uh, into its uh, agenda. Uh, in 2000, and then uh, since 2015, we've seen a lot of effort uh, that is being made by the two sides in that direction. So South Sudan is extremely important, and um, I think the the developmental uh, peace uh, theory is something that I think is going to is going to be front and center uh, as FOCAC moves forward. If we look at the record of of Chinese engagements. Uh, ever since the, even before the Belt and Road uh, was established, China has been involved in these in these in these efforts uh, in Sudan and South Sudan, uh, even in Rwanda, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo during the uh, problems that the two countries were experiencing in Zimbabwe, uh, as well as as well as uh, as well as Djibouti. Uh, China has also had these uh, peace building um, uh, activities. Uh, in other countries, uh, places like Syria, Afghanistan, uh, Myanmar, and many other places. So I think it is, it is you know, since, since 2013, uh, China has really uh, been, moving, been moving in this direction. So Lena, Paul is confident that peacekeeping, post-conflict stability and on those operations will be important in the upcoming FOCAC. When you heard Paul discussing that, what's your thought and what's your reaction? I mean, yes, definitely FOCAC is a milestone. Uh, any, any time there's a summit, it's a milestone. It's also a critical time. It's very important to uh, try to basically before FOCAC, try to influence the agenda items before the, for, be, before the meeting, before at, at this you know, consultation time, because right now, right now is when the agenda items are going to be decided. Uh, right now is when the action plan points are going to be decided. Um, you know, showtime in September is just going to be just that. It's showtime. It's, it's too late to shape any of these points. So it is very important to link this moment uh, of South Sudan-China relations to FOCAC. So that is very important. Um, when I hear him speak about the developmental peace approach and, 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 the, and the centeredness and importance of peace and stability to FOCAC, I agree with that 100%. Um, but it's also important to hear that China's approach to peacekeeping, peace building and, 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 and uh, 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 peacemaking is all very much development driven, which means any time that China is negotiating development projects, whether these are infrastructure projects or these are health sector, public health sector projects, or they are education projects, these are all perceived to be steps towards peace, towards stability, towards uh, 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 ending the conflict and keeping the peace. So it is understood from this perspective. So it's not necessarily, you know, uh, looking at, you know, peacekeeping from that sort of governance measure or democratic, you know, uh, institution uh, kind of perspective. So I agree with Paul, we're going to see um, we're going to see a lot of these projects be discussed in, at, at FOCAC. Um, and overall, yes, you can absolutely uh, make the argument that, that these are projects that are going to um, uh, contribute to peace uh, building and peacemaking in South Sudan because of the link that in, 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 in sort of in this uh, developmental peace uh, thinking uh, that development is deeply linked to security, deeply linked to peace. You know, in, in in the discussion of of developmental peace, um, uh, I've I, you know I've seen it kind of reduced to to the uh, to the idea, um, you know, a contrast between between maybe words you frequently ascribe to to Western thinking that this this idea that one needs peace in order to have development, and then you know the uh, kind of countered by a Ch Chinese concept of of you need development in order to have peace, or you need to at, at least you, you need to kickstart development while the peacemaking is still is still going on. On the ground, is there really a, a do you really see a big difference between these two different approaches, um, or is it you know kind of or do they kind of meld into each other a little bit one when one looks at, at them the actual implementation? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very good question, Kobus. I I mean I think on the ground you're going to see this kind of quote unquote sort of Western model uh, also put 
emphasis on development. So this idea that development is important for peace it cannot be looked at as um, innovation of sort of a Chinese way of thinking about it. It's not exclusively Chinese. But at the same time, I think the difference is that you will not, for example, see a Chinese right now, at least, a Chinese approach to peacekeeping that's going to say you have to prioritize elections or governance or uh, anti-corruption measures or human rights protection right now. Those things are going to are secondary to providing economic opportunities, lifting people out of poverty, giving jobs, uh, and so the, the 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 philosophy of peace is understood as coming from economic growth, coming from economic development, and not from basic rights uh, in in the sort of that liberal uh, understanding of you know so democratic rights and freedoms and all of that. So. The approaches are slightly different. On the ground, I think um, you see priorities laid out differently for sure. Uh, in, the, in the sense, as I mentioned earlier, then the, there, is a, there is a focus that I've noticed just from fieldwork and from my own research on the Chinese side. There's a huge focus on just providing opportunities for young people to get training, to get skills, to have jobs. To, and that's the thinking. Now, whether it works or not, that's the, we can talk about that later. But the idea is that you have to start by providing opportunities for economic growth um, and not necessarily starting by organizing elections or by thinking about, you know, all of these uh, kind of, you know, values, norms that are, you know, broadly typically attached to liberal peace. Um, so so that's, that, that's, that's the, the main difference from, from my view. But I really would like to emphasize that you know, that um, focusing on development is not uniquely Chinese um, in, in per se. It's interesting you bring up this this idea that there's differences and differences in expectations as well, because that was one of the themes of the conversation that we had. And there are very different expectations that, that coming from the Chinese as coming from African stakeholders. And a lot of it focused on the role of the special envoy. So one of the hallmarks of Chinese diplomacy in South Sudan was the appointment of what they called a special representative. The first special representative to that role was Liu Guijin, followed by Zhong Jianhua. And it's been one of the highest profile diplomatic postings for the Chinese in Africa. Very visible, very outspoken, very public role, much more so than the typical ambassador role where you don't really hear from them very much. However, interestingly enough, Chinese stakeholders are constantly trying to downplay the importance of this role. And in many ways, they're trying to set expectations in such a way that it contrasts with what we expect of, say, a U.S. mediator, for example. So in the Yugoslavia war or in the Mideast peace process, the American mediator is one who kind of forces them into a room, says, we're going to get a deal and that's it. And the Chinese are saying, uh-uh, that's not our style. For some perspective on that, it was really interesting to hear from Professor Liu Haifeng, who's an associate professor at Peking University and the executive director of the Center of African Studies, also at Peking University. Professor Liu is one of the most well-known China-Africa scholars in China. She's a very, very well-known in the, in the academic community. Her perspective is very interesting. Let's take a listen to what Professor Liu has said about the role of the special envoy. And then I also want to briefly mention about this special envoy. Actually, um, there are already three Chinese African Affairs special envoy. And then lately, there is a picture I want to share with you. This is uh, the current special envoy, Ms. Uh, Xu Jinghu. And then uh, she made a talk in the spring this year. Uh, and then there are lots of uh, Chinese scholars participated. I was also very luckily involved. And then uh, I asked uh, this ambassador Xu this particular questions about this mechanism, how she defined this uh, Chinese special envoy mechanism. And then uh, here I quoted from her. She said, uh, uh, this mechanism since the beginning 
has been uh, very clear uh, that the goal is just to enhance African solutions. Um, I remember lately we being my my students and I we interviewed the first Chinese special envoy, Professor Ambassador Liu Guizhen. He emphasized again for many times that we um, uh, we cannot even call ourselves mediator. We uh, probably mostly correctly call ourselves promoter for peace because uh, there is no Chinese mediation for, uh, formula, no any special sp- suggestion about what South Sudan should go forward. Rather, it works with ego. So this came as a bit of a surprise, I think, to a lot of African observers and maybe even other outside observers. Again, how... Professor Liu is trying to downplay expectations. The Chinese are playing a much more passive role than a traditional mediator. Talk to us a little bit about what you thought of those comments. I I, I think with with great involvement come great expectations and um, uh, basically playing up the role of negotiating or mediating um, sets the bar high, sets the expectations high. And, uh, of course, after years and years of experience with the issue, as we've heard uh, on, on, on the panel, we, we learned that possibly uh, the Chinese special envoys perhaps are readjusting the expectations, perhaps lowering a bit the bar, because, uh, because then the expectation is going to be you know, higher than, than what can be delivered. So being a little bit more realistic about what can be achieved um, and so, I mean, I, I think that's that's one thing that came to my mind. The other thing that came to my mind was, um, in a way, you know, if you have it, it's it's a, it's a really difficult kind of conundrum. You have external players who are very uh, influential, like China, and on the one hand, you have um, this idea that you don't want to put the peace process only in the hands of external actors. That's not going to work out. But on the other hand, part of me, when I hear, um, you know, kind of deflecting that responsibility to South Sudanese people themselves, it kind of seems like you're on your own now. It kind of seems like... Yeah, like what's the point then? I mean, exactly. if you're, not, I mean, if you're exactly. just going to take a passive role, then what's the point? Yeah, Exactly. Then, then you're just giving up in a way or just kind of you know, letting them kind of figure it out by themselves, which I guess, you know, is on the one hand, it kind of makes sense when you say it theoretically, but on the other hand, there's a lot more at stake in this than South Sudanese internal players only. I mean, obviously, we can talk about the oil uh, uh, sector, we can talk about all kinds of other interests that are overlapping there. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit unsettling for me when uh, when I think about that question. Yeah, but Kobus, the problem that the Chinese have is that they're bound by their non-interference doctrine, which says that they will not interfere in the internal affairs of another country. Their presence in South Sudan is at the invitation of the South Sudanese government under the auspices of uh, EGAD and the United Nations. So they themselves, Beijing, will not insert itself actively in the process because that could be construed as violating the non-interference doctrine. How do you see that balance that they're trying that they're trying to strike? I mean, this their involvement in, in the mediation process has always been characterized as as uh, you know, kind of testing the limits of, of the non-interference doctrine. So I guess this is you know, this is what it, what that kind of turns out to be. Um, I was I was intrigued by the phrasing that that they're there to support African solutions, um, which obviously you know that that kind of that the, the language of African solutions to African problems goes back to to South Africa's former president Thabo Mbeki. You know, kind of, he was really kind of pushing that kind of Africa-centered uh, conflict resolution model, um, and you know, so so I was wondering whether whether there was any implication there that that they might that they're kind of working behind the scenes with other African actors, including the African Union or you know, kind of other you know, kind of border states and so on. Because of course, in in the South Sudanese conflict, some some kind of border states or, or, or neighboring states are are involved. So you know, so so it it, it kind of opened this kind of interesting door while seemingly also trying to kind of, as, as Lina said, trying to kind of lower expectations all around. I think uh, I, I, I will just go back to the panel and uh, we, one of the interventions was by a representative uh, from the African Union. And it's kind of interesting to see, you know, when you go back to all the remarks made, 
there wasn't um it wasn't very clear to me i i think that i think the goal of this panel was probably to reignite that conversation between china and involving kind of the au and 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 doing you know the work even if it's behind the scenes i think that that was one of the goals of 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 the meeting was to reignite that that process but i think um it wasn't very clear to me that at this time there is a lot of work being done. I think the idea was that uh, that you know that that the issue has been kind of put aside and that um, that uh, stakeholders would like to see more engagement on the part of China, uh, whether it's through the AU or or um, regional actors uh, to 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 go back and and try to push forward um, the peace process. Yeah, and it's definitely the case that the current special representative is nowhere near as visible as previous special representatives. And one of those previous representatives, Zhong Jianhua, was actually there. And for those of you who are not familiar with Ambassador Zhong, um, he's the former special envoy to South Sudan. He was the second special envoy to South Sudan. He's also the former ambassador to South Africa. And he spent nine years on the Sino-British Joint Liaison Group that negotiated the 1997 handover of Hong Kong from Britain back to China. So that just gives you an idea that this guy is a heavy hitter. And just the idea that they were putting their top-tier diplomats, and these guys were in front of the cameras all the time. That being said, I think he's retired now, so he, he's not in active service. Uh, but it was, it was really exciting for me that he was there because uh, – We've never had the chance to have him on the show or to speak with him, or I've never even heard him in an interview because all of his comments that I've ever heard are highly scripted and highly orchestrated. So it was very, very exciting to hear him in an unscripted format like this. He, too, focused a lot of his remarks on the role of the Chinese special envoy in this conflict and in this in this process, and he also echoed what Professor Liu was saying in terms of managing the expectations of what China can actually accomplish in this kind of diplomacy. The role of China in the peace process of South Sudan should never be overestimated. My personal feelings that when I first entered into South Sudan process and the talk with so many peoples, I really was shocked to understand it's a, such a complicated case for, for us. Particularly, it's a challenge for Chinese. In our sense, a country, a state, in our understanding and explanation, is completely different from most of the politicians I met with in South Sudan. And uh, sometimes I do have the doubt that are we talking about a country, a fate of a country, a future of a country, a future of people? And uh, sometimes give the sense that it seems we are talking about somebody else. So I think maybe I, I, I really feel humble to, to, to suggest this a sense of country building for this young, it's already 10 years now. 10 years anniversary has just been celebrated, but uh, still to building the consensus of a country of South Sudan probably is the most important thing. When you reach the consensus, you have the hope to build the peace. If, if some of the people there who is still playing a important role in the political life in South Sudan, think they can take a piece of this and piece of that. It is difficult. It is difficult. Particularly for us. I think I, it took me several years to understand this. It is what certainly took a longer time for a lot of people from China to understand, to understand this. So we always think if we want to solve the problem of South Sudan, it must first come the South Sudan people themselves. Then the neighboring country, the regional country, then the AU, then the outsider. However active we want to be to play this, the consequences could never change. That's my humble opinions. Thank you very much. That 
is very interesting because we rarely hear a Chinese diplomat of that level kind of spell it out so clearly for us as to how the Chinese view these things. And again, it, it says we can't do anything unless you first reach some degree of consensus. That does kind of make sense, don't you think? I mean, well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that goes back to uh, Dr. Madud's points when he was laying out uh, the the. the the background and the context of the conflict, a lot of it was, um, you know, the, 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 the different fractions internally and the political rivalries within South Sudan and how those divisions basically instigated, created and also prolonged the, 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 the conflict. And I think it absolutely makes sense to, um, you know, kind of basically take the position that there's not a lot you can do until you have everybody internally on the same page, and then you move forward. But can you nudge them forward, though? I guess that's the question. Can you be more active in, in kind of nudging them forward? Exactly, and that's, that is the point. I mean, we heard that come out of, uh, you know, Dr. Madud's comments as well. In, in a way, he said, he said we, we sort of need these other external stakeholders to play a role in putting everybody pe- back on the, on the same page internally, because otherwise you just have this sort of catch-22 situation where you can't do anything until there's consensus and you also cannot reach consensus if other incentives are not created, both internally and, and, and externally. So, you know, otherwise, you know, you, this is the, the, you know, the classic definition of a stalemate. Uh, and that's what the, the whole goal of this is to move the needle a bit on this conversation and try to inject a bit of energy towards, you know, trying to do something um, uh, to, to, to basically, you know, convene all these conversations that need to happen. So the Dr. Madut that Lina is referring to is the Professor Ekok Madut, who's an assistant professor at the University of Juba. And we're going to hear from him later on. Kobus, let's hear from you now, though. Lina, did, did you get an impression that, that, that China was, was playing it particularly kind of softly in, compared, in comparison to, to some of the other external actors in, 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 where, where, some, where the Americans or, or other ones, uh, other actors more like, you know, kind of pushing a kind of somewhat harder line? Um, I didn't really get that impression, mostly because the f- greater focus of the conversation was uh, specifically on China. So it wasn't so much sort of a, in that comparative angle. But what seemed to me um, to be the case was because of China's um, greater involvement with Sudan and with South Sudan, uh, it just gave it a lot of visibility and that great visibility gave a lot of expectations as to what role China can play. And yeah, and a lot of the conversation was, uh, you know, the Chinese perspective on this, both Professor Liu Haifang and also uh, conversations we've had, um, kind of were trying to temper down a little bit the, you know, the role of China in the conversation, take away from that visibility and try to deflect a bit that responsibility onto other actors, whether these are regional actors in the continent or outside of it. Um, but it didn't seem to me like the conversation was thinking about, I mean, the U.S. was mentioned maybe one time, but it wasn't uh, very kind of clear what expectations were put, were put on other actors. It seemed the conversation seemed focused mostly, mostly on China. And that might also be because I think there's a sense of fatigue in Washington about South Sudan. You know, there was a lot of excitement in Washington uh, early on because the Christian right was instrumental in the creation of this of this young country and this new country. And then when it didn't go according to plan, Americans kind of backed off and they moved on to something else. And I think there's been a difficulty in mobilizing interest in Washington to re-engage this process as well. It does feel futile to a lot of American stakeholders. I'd love to be able to speak with somebody on that, so we'll be looking for a guest on that. But there is one word that came up that really was interesting, and it's the word passive. And let's stay with Ambassador Zhong because he used this word passive, and it's again, it's our theme of the Chinese approach to this diplomacy, but it really sparked a very interesting conversation with Dr. Madut as well. Even in my time, I traveled there so many times every year. And eventually I realized that the role China can play here is mostly a passive, passive role. We, we eventually realized However active we want to be, China, United States, and also the Troikat, 
we eventually, almost all of us understand that without the African lead, without the African initiative, without the African solution, we, we, we would never have any chance to succeed. So all we can do is to encourage those countries, of course, South Sudan is the first and all the EGAD countries, to take the lead, to take the responsibility yourself. All we can do is to encourage, to support, but cannot just, I, I don't think that China at least cannot think we, we are the initiative party. So that word passive, it got, a, it got an immediate reaction from, from Dr. Madud uh, from University of Juba. He said, no, 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 we need China to be active. And I, I'm wondering when, when that conversation was going on about this passive versus active, it was something lost in translation there, do you think, in terms of understanding the Chinese approach? Now, Dr. Madut is a very, very knowledgeable expert on South Sudan Chinese affairs. He's very familiar with Chinese foreign policy, so he understands it. But it was interesting that he zeroed in on that word passive, and he said, we need China to be active. What did you think of that? I, I think the word passive uh, wasn't a big surprise for me when I heard it. I think there's a certain degree of, of humility and moderation and, and also sort of playing it down that we're used to when it comes to um, listening to Chinese diplomats speak about the whether it's achievements or involvement uh, uh, of China in similar situations. So I wasn't so surprised by the word passive. Um, but at the same time, I thought that, you know, that it was important to highlight um, the other side of it, which is what Dr. Madhu uh, was trying to, to say there, is that, you know, it, it's, it, it, could be, it could be viewed as the easy way out. It could just be viewed as, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the least costly option is to basically say, um, you know, we are not here to do much and we cannot do much and therefore... Um, you know, we, we can wait and stand by until there's some consensus reached and then we can uh, move forward. So, I, I mean, I think, I think um, this highlights precisely one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, of, of the peace process right now. Is it a conversation to be had internally? Uh, as we've heard from one of the speakers speaking about the ownership, uh, the conflict uh, is owned by South Sudan and the solution should be owned by local actors? Is it a regional issue? Is it international community thing? Uh, to which extent are we going to blend all these approaches? Uh, and so that actually put uh, the, the, the finger on a huge uh, part of why this is still a, a, a challenge and is still, a, you know, it's, it's kind of reaching a, a stagnating uh, stage of the, of the problem is, is those divergent views of uh, who should be involved and to what extent. And Kobus, we heard in Ambassador Zhong's comments there really the core pillars of China's approach to diplomacy. Again, it is about consensus-based. It's about having African solutions. It's not imposing Chinese solutions. It's a real contrast in many ways to the U.S.-Europeans approach, which is oftentimes much more assertive in its diplomacy. I think it also it, it sounded to me also that like it was walking a line um, where it was, was really trying to to kind of uh, to emphasize or, or, or to, to to be sensitive to African concerns about in, in, um, you know encroachments on, on African sovereignty um, you know so so you frequently hear when you speak to African diplomats or this you know. Uh, the, you you hear the, the the kind of crisis and then the NATO invasion of Libya in 2011. You hear that come up surprisingly often, um, and and the the you know kind of the, the wider kind of like issue of regime change or like external externally forced regime change still comes up a lot in in, in discussions. And it, it, it seemed to me that 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 was also kind of a, a nod in that direction. You know, kind of that 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 uh, this kind of assurance that external actors are not going to be too inter interventionist. Um, and it was then very interesting to hear, like, the, you know, kind of some South Sudanese actors going back, no, no, we need you to be more interventionist. No, no. And, and, <laughs> and, and to be fair, the, the South Sudanese representatives on the panel and the African 
representatives on the panel were very enthusiastic about Chinese engagement. And it's it's interesting because if you're sitting in a place like Europe or the United States, I think you're unaccustomed to seeing such an embrace of the Chinese in this kind of diplomacy, given the current temperature in those two regions. So let's get to uh, Dr. Ekok Madut, who is that assistant professor at the University of Juba, who Lena mentioned on, on a couple of occasions. He, again, very, very knowledgeable on these issues, and he really had nothing but nice things to say about China's historical role in the South Sudanese peace process. I'm trying to em- emphasize the importance of partners in the implementation of the RRCs and the long-term peace in South Sudan. And I believe China is an important factor. Sometimes uh, some outsiders might have a different opinion, but my own opinion, I think China, since 2005, peace agreement, despite there were no witnesses, there have been uh, a positive factor in South Sudan throughout the peace implementation, uh, all the way to the referendum, and beyond. Uh, also, during this conflict, China played a very major role. And I think, despite China is is in a learning curve in terms of conflict resolution experiences, it has done well in the case of South Sudan since 2013, 2014, until until now. So China should take a lead because China has an economic interest that requires stability. So there you have it. So despite the passivity and some of the aspects of Chinese diplomacy that a lot of outsiders may not understand, Dr. Akuk, I think, gave real voice to the enthusiasm on the part of many in South Sudan for China's participation and what they've been able to do, their record in South Sudan. I think that's definitely correct. I I, I think he laid out a very good a uh, summary of the different ways in which we, 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 when we think about Chinese engagement, what does that mean and what areas and sectors and very much the, what you said. I mean, the, 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 the Chinese companies have been engaged uh, in something that showed up also in Professor Liu Haifang's uh, presentation. They've been engaged in a lot of different sectors that we haven't seen external actors be engaged in at all. Uh, because with the independence of a country, you just have all kinds of things that you have to build, uh, a lot of it from scratch. And a lot of that legwork has been put by Chinese companies and has been facilitated through these uh, 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 encouragements and through these relations between China and South Sudan in ways that we haven't seen other external actors at all, uh, you know, dig deep into this uh, kind of really, uh, you know, basic infrastructure work. Um, so I think that, you know, from that sense, it's definitely encouraging to see the extent to which we've seen uh, China in, get involved in, 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 in shaping, um, you know, the, 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 the um, peace and the build the construction, I guess, um, you know, in South Sudan. But at the same time, um, like you said, uh, <laughs> there were uh, several... Um, small uh, details in what Dr. Madut said that kind of contrasted nicely with, you know, with, with what other panelists were saying. Um, and so, yeah, that made for a rich conversation there. One of the one of the points that he made also is that you know is, is that China has a, a direct economic stake in all of this, of course, in in the South Sudanese oil industry. So I was actually, you know, like. Oil, the issues around oil and, and China and Africa have, have, have shifted so much in the last in the last decade. Um, with China diversifying its sources around the world, now buying a lot more oil from from places like Saudi Arabia, Russia, and so on than they they used to buy from Africa. Um, and at the same time, uh, I saw some reports recently that that um, in the first place that that the the output from South Sudanese oil fields might be less than expected. Reuters reported that like two or three days ago. And also Petronas, the, the Malaysian oil, state-owned oil company, um, that if, if I'm correct, I think was was a, 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 an investor in South Sudan in the past, has indicated that they that they are, might not participate in, 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 you know, kind of in future exploration there. So I was wondering what you make of this kind of stake of China in, in in the kind of oil industry in South Sudan in, against the background of all of these shifts, you know, kind of like what, what, what is the role of oil in, in, in the conflict and the conflict resolution right now? 
Um, I think very, uh, what, what I saw, I mean, obviously we all know, I mean, South Sudan's uh, basically uh, budget, uh, economic budget, state budget sky is really highly dependent on petroleum revenues. I mean, I think something above the 90% of the budget is dependent on petroleum revenues. So they, you know, when you have a situation where you're dependent to that extent, um, then there are two ways forward, either um, you know, you have to diversify the sources of income um, and that diversification is a huge part of the conversation in terms of um, in terms of, you know, where the country is headed right now or the other the other uh, uh, option uh, or scenario is that there's going to be more conflict around trying to tap into that and having control over the that resource because it is the only one that matters right now it's the only one that matters in south sudan and that is deeply problematic um and i think uh because of that uh, steep uh, dependence on on oil um uh, we've seen china basically i want i don't want to say shift uh, uh but definitely get involved in diversifying in this whole project of diversifying uh, the the economy in in South Sudan, there are lots of projects going on right now. Um, a lot of them state uh, sponsored Chinese government state sponsored projects, and some of them are have to do with agriculture. Others have to do with um, encouraging medium to small to uh, to uh, small to medium size uh, enterprises. Um, and you know, and and there's there's a clear sense that um, there's need to 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 get to to diversify the economy. Uh, and um, I think that you know, so far we've seen China both kind of try to it on its own uh, solve its it sort of get away from its dependence on the oil, but also on the same at the same time get involved with. Um, these other platforms, these other um, sources of, of 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 economic diversification in South Sudan. So you kind of see it operate on both on those both levels. Yeah, let's let's close out our discussion focusing on the U.S. China aspect of all of this. As you mentioned, there was very little mention of the United States, and the, the U.S. has been an instrumental player in the South Sudan peace process. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my comments at the show, at the top of the show. It's really one of the rare spots where U.S. and Chinese diplomats like Ambassador Zhong have talked and collaborated and cooperated in a rather low-pressure environment. And we think about that in the context of what's happened this week where Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman was in Tianjin and the talks did not go well with her, with the Chinese counterparts, Wang Yi there, the foreign minister. And the it just seems like U.S.-China relations are on this steady path downwards. And South Sudan does, in fact, offer an opportunity and a venue for these two countries to actually find some common ground. And once again, we're going to go back to Dr. Madud and get his take on that. I think South Sudan is among the few cases where China and, and the U.S. cooperate. And they have done it several times. The role of China and Troika, led by the U.S., is very important because both countries, U.S. and China, have interest. So Dr. Madut is right that both the U.S. and China have interests, but I'm wondering if he's a little bit out of date here. The United States now refers to China as a genocidal country for its treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The rhetoric has gotten so sour and so aggressive on both sides that even South Sudan may not be a place where these two countries can actually come together. You're in the United States. You follow what goes on in Washington quite closely. What's your assessment of the potential of the U.S. and China to resume their once fruitful cooperation on issues like South Sudan? I think that sounds so far away from reality right now. I don't know if it will keep being that uh, that way, <laughs> but it sounds... Um, yeah, it, it does not sound to me like there will be a direct kind of, you know, intentional uh, collaboration on this issue uh, right now. I think if indirectly, then you have, because the U.S. also have a special envoy, um, uh, uh, Donald Booth, 
um, who has worked in the region. He's, he's extremely knowledgeable. He's, he's an expert on, on the region, has, has worked on this uh, for decades. Uh, but, um, but um, you know, uh, if we see probably some, you know, kind of indirect way where you have the envoys or, you know, or representatives or diplomats working on behind the scenes on getting the political stakeholders and getting, you know, the government officials and the civil society partners to get together and try to put pressure on them to move forward, then maybe. Uh, But I just don't see any uh, sign that we will have sort of an intentional pick up the phone and talk to the special envoy on the Chinese side to try to to see what can be done. I think right now the U.S. and China see, uh, or at least on the U.S. side, sees China's involvement in Africa in general as a zero-sum game. Where China is involved, the U.S. is losing. And I think if you approach... uh, uh, issues from that perspective, any question, any issue, any problem, any angle from that sort of zero sum, then the first thing you rule out is cooperation. So um, if, 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 if perhaps in a way indirectly the, there, there is some form of um, facilitation, perhaps, but I don't know that I, 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 will, not, I will not put my money on seeing um, some intentional collaboration between the US and China on South Sudan. I completely agree with Lena that that I think the the, the current framing of of China's involvement in Africa as fundamentally a problem for the United States, you know, kind of is makes cooperation much harder. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I, I can imagine if you know China's China's work in South Sudan has, has always been very closely linked to to the the UN. You know, and, and the China the Chinese troops were there under a UN banner. So if there's some kind of space in you know some kind of multilateral space in which Chinese actors can be drawn in with you know kind of actors from from Europe. Europe and, and the United States, then maybe that starts becoming a bit easier. But uh, yeah, I completely agree with, with Lena. I think it, it looks very difficult at the moment. Um, Lena, just just kind of overall, like having, having listened to this whole conversation, like what what did what was the kind of how optimistic did it make you overall about the the kind of the future of of South Sudanese peace? Did, did it seem like that they are kind of moving somewhat forward? Um, I think I got uh, I was very encouraged when. Um to hear the perspective uh, from civil society groups. Um, so we had uh, uh, a very, I think, a very uh, fruitful intervention by Adam Leek, uh, who basically was talking about, um, you know, what all is happening on the ground in terms of uh, the, 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 the influence and the direction of civil society groups uh, trying to put pressure on specific issues, uh, trying to uh, basically lobby, whether it's the European Union or China or the US or other actors, uh, to basically um, uh, put, you know, uh, focus on anti-corruption measures, focus on accountability that came up a lot. Um, and I think this awareness of the conflict, the awareness of what is going on, and the awareness of what needs to be uh, overcome for the country to move forward made me feel optimistic because I think that's the number one thing is you have to understand sort of the root uh, cause of the problem. You have to understand what's, what's making it last and linger. And I think that a lot of that work is done by civil society organizations within South Sudan. And I was very encouraged to hear some of these activists basically lay out a very clear plan. This is what we would like to recommend. This is what we would like to see from the AU, from regional actors, from the international community. This is the kind of pressure we want to see. And I think that that was very encouraging. There was a lot of momentum going on um, in trying to push for these. Now, when you zoom out, when you look at the, the conflict from the perspective of the international community, um, maybe the picture isn't as uh, uh, shiny for me. I think perhaps um, it's a bit more bleak because, because of course, because then you know, then the interests of international and external actors can very much conflict with the interest of these activists because then you have a group of elites 
who are in the middle, who can be sort of co-opted this way, or they can be co-opted the other way, or they can be working against these activists and social and, so, and civil society activists, so they can be working with them. So in a way, when you are that group sort of stuck in the middle between the interests of local elites and the interests of external actors, then it becomes a little bit difficult to see um, kind of, uh, you know, light uh, through through that. But I mean, in general, I thought, I mean, I thought the goal of this conversation was to inject momentum. And when you say that, you're already assuming that it's basically stale, that at this point it is stagnating. And that is the reality on the ground, that it's not, there's not a whole lot of excitement about this. Not many people are, are not talking about this. News are not reporting on this. It's kind of put on the side, uh, on the back burner of a lot of agendas. And I think the interest was to create a little bit of energy uh, to put this back on the table. And I think that, um, you know, that, that, that's what, that's what needs to happen uh, if, if we're going to see, you know, kind of, you know, re-energized interest in, 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 in this conversation. Um, I was a bit discouraged, if I, if I can say this, uh, uh, about um, sort of the kind of hands-off approach uh, that, um, th- that may come across as we hear the perspectives, uh, the sort of the Chinese perspective on the issue. Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm in favor of inter- interventionism. I'm saying this as, as sort of, you know, a, you know, South Sudan just now is 10 years old. CCP, same month, was celebrated in 100 years. Uh, that puts different perspectives on, on, on the matter. Uh, with 100 years of, you know, experience, uh, you know, with governance, with development, with poverty, with, with all kinds of things, uh, where, 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 how can that sort of fit into China's approach in South Sudan? 100 years versus 10 years, I think um, I was a little bit maybe um, put off a little bit by that sort of hands-off approach because, because, because I think about it in this perspective. Yeah, and there's, a, there's a, a big space in between being passive and interventionist. You can be active in, in terms of bringing up the issue at the United Nations, which, by the way, just this week, the Chinese ambassador to the United Nations did raise the issue of South Sudan and the need for re-energizing the peace process. So on that front, there, there's more that can be done. I think the Chinese would probably come out and say, listen, we've got troops deployed there. We're doing you know, agricultural engagements. We're doing a lot. But uh, to your point, more can be done and more needs to be done in part because the peace process does seem to, to have stalled. We are very happy that we were able to play a very small part in hosting this discussion and honored that you served as moderator for the conversation that, again, if nothing else, just starts to get some of the people back to the table again. In this case, it was the academic and the diplomatic community. We're going to do another one later in the year as well, and hopefully you'll be able to join us for that as well. Lena, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Lena Ben Abdallah is an assistant professor at Wake Forest University, a well-known China-Africa scholar and also the author of Shaping the Future of Power, Knowledge Production and Network Building in China-Africa Relations. Unlike most books written by academics, this one is actually affordable and accessible on Amazon. So it's not $85 for a Kindle edition. So you can go out and you can buy it on Amazon. I'll put links to it in our show notes, and I'll put a link that we did with Lena about the book also in the show notes. Uh, Lena, you are a regular commentator on Twitter where you're sharing ideas about what you're reading and writing. If people want to find you on the Twitter, where can they do that? Uh, my Twitter handle is at uh, L Ben Abdallah, so my initial and then last name. Um, so I, I should be easily found there. Or as you said, just looking at uh, the, the links and the notes that you're going to put, that should be easy as well. Wonderful. Well, I'll put a link to your Twitter handle and the book and also your profile in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. And thank you for moderating the panel. Thank you so much for having me. It's always great to join you and Cobus. Cobus, wow, what an intense conversation. I mean, there's a lot of information to absorb in that. There's so much that is you have to read in between the lines in what Ambassador Zhong and Professor Liu were saying in terms of the approach of Chinese diplomacy. Some of it is the historical approach, again, the non-interference, the more passivity. I, I do echo some of the concerns that Lena put forward about 
Maybe this isn't the time for passivity and China does need to play a more active role. Maybe not interventionist because it'll never be interventionist, but at the same time, it can do more and should do more maybe in that sense. I think Chinese stakeholders will say, well, wait a minute, what are you saying we do more? The U.S. doesn't have forces deployed there. As far as I know, the U.K. doesn't have forces deployed there. We've got forces deployed there. So it, it kind of maybe there's a diplomatic stalemate as much as there's a stalemate on the ground among the, the rival factions. Yeah, that, that that could be. I mean, the you know, the, the I think the fundamental problem is is with with this kind of conflict, particularly one where where so much of the conflict has to do with with as Lena pointed out, the, the like who controls the single strategic resource, you know, that everyone's fighting fighting for. That then it, it becomes really easy to to kind of undermine any kind of any kind of peace deal, you know, kind of in in that situation, and so any any real peace deal would have to come already with with kind of pre approval from from the, the the big the big players on the ground. Um, there's no way of, of for external you know kind of actors to force that. It, it, it you know if there isn't if there isn't you know, a willingness from all sides to actually come to to a deal, then then it becomes very very easy for any of them to to you know to to pull out. Um, so you know so so I have sympathy for for the complexities facing China. On on the, on the other hand, I do agree with you that that you know some uh, kind of a more forceful approach would also help to kind of focus more attention from all of these actors on the need to actually move forward. So interesting statistic uh, came out today that I put in our newsletter, and and it made me think of South Sudan that. In June, they broke the single-month record in China for the number of new energy vehicle sales. And that means new energy is basically electrified. And so it got me thinking, okay, so as we're preparing for the show today, that this is a country in South Sudan that, again, gets 96 97% of its revenue from oil. And China is moving as quickly as it possibly can into new energy vehicles and wants to be uh, at least reduced its its dependence on oil. Europe is going into a post-carbon future. What do you think a country like South Sudan looks like in 20, 30 years when China, Japan, the United States, and Europe no longer consume the oil that Africa and South Sudan produces? I mean, you know, I've I've raised this question in, in relation to a whole bunch of different countries, including Nigeria. It's like, you know... The, you, There's you nothing really, else there. There's no you, plan B. Yeah, exactly. It's like these these countries are not planning for a post oil future, and in fact, some of those, many of them are, are, are doubling down, trying to get kind of pipelines and other infrastructure built to try and squeeze out that last little bit, you know, before the whole planet goes up in flames. So, you know, so so it's it's, it's very dismaying for me, and and in 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 the situation of of South Sudan, where you know South Sudan when it was part of Sudan proper you know it it was it was this kind of classic african situation where where a, a resource rich re region ends up being kind of starved of development you know um and ends up just being this kind of pantry that just you know kind of keeps getting raided um with with nothing kind of re reinvested on the ground there you know kind of the 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 investment and the and the, and the profit went to khatoum um you know so so the, the that that is an incredibly difficult situation to solve um, because you know, because in, in order to to solve it, you need to essentially restructure the entire society. You know, you need to, as Lena said, there's 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 gaps on every single sector. You know, everything from education to water treatment to everything is is lacking. Um, you know, and 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 the the idea originally was that the oil was going to be paying for this. So that I think was was part of the blueprint of of, of the original U.S. support for independence. And you know, I think I think discussing the the future of South Sudan, you keep having to pull in these these big powers because the calculus behind the independence of South Sudan was, to a certain extent, also fueled by American concerns uh, uh, about Chinese involvement with with Sudan proper. You know, if you remember that, you know that there was a lot of a lot of um, protests around the two thousand eight Olympics. Um, yeah, you know, about because. Darfur. Yeah, around Darfur and, and 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 support that China was giving to to Sudan. So it's South Sudan has always been this kind of creature of great power conflict, you know. And it, like the great powers can't be allowed to 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 abandon it. The great powers have to keep being engaged and trying to kind of like make things better because otherwise it's just a complete nightmare. Says who? I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? Yes, ideally you would think that's the case, but I guess I'm starting to wonder now that. 
you know, Anthony Blinken at the State Department is got limited bandwidth. He's very Europeanist in his approach. He's focusing most of his attention on China now. And Africa has not been very prominent on his agenda. And I'm just wondering if, you, you know, as we've talked about in 20, 30 years, as we move into a post-carbon future, there's no plan B in a country like South Sudan. So maybe the United States and China are just like, unless they can figure this out on their own, maybe we'll, we'll be there, but we're not going to be we're not going to force the situation because there's a certain futility to it all. I don't know, but I'm just, it doesn't seem like these big powers are, are really excited about this. Well, you know, this, this would be, this would be the space where, you know, I agree with you that I, I don't see particularly see, see Blinken being very excited about this, but this, this is, this is perfect for Samantha Power, the, the new, the new head of, of, of USAID. Oh, she loves, you because, know, I she's mean, never she, seen a, she loves intervention. Yeah, she and, is and an interventionist uh, and, you know, and she's yeah. now at the head of the, of the development agency. And there's a lot of development to be done in South Sudan. So let's go, let's see. Well, we will get a really clear picture on this. Like the mystery will be solved sometime in September. Again, we don't know exactly when the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit will take place. The Chinese have this very unusual approach where they don't announce the date until a few weeks before, and it's like, surprise, your you know, FOCAC's coming. We're like, okay, scramble. Okay, so we know it's in Dakar. We know it's in September. And, well, actually, we don't know it's in September. We think it's in September. Assume it's in September. And, and that will give us a really clear roadmap because as we heard from Paul Nantulli at the beginning, uh, peace and security has been a key hallmark of FOCAC past. And I suspect that they're going to try and shift more attention into peace and security and away from big infrastructure projects, the massive loans. So we'll see more emphasis on potentially places like the DRC and South Sudan and less on big infrastructure loans and projects. Again, pure speculation on my part, but we will find out in September. I would. I. I'm a little less less optimistic that we're going to get a clear roadmap in, at FOCAC. You know, I, I more expect kind of like broad and vague you know, kind of <laughs> utterances. But I do think that what will probably, like well, one thing I, I, I expect is that that a lot of this kind of thing will be bundled under initiatives like the Health Silk Road, for example. Um, and, you know, so, so I can imagine that 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 those those kind of Belt and Road kind of organs could could function to to pump more resources into, into areas like South Sudan where they really need it, hopefully. Okay, let's leave our conversation there. It was fantastic to have Lena, and it was really this is the first time we've hosted a a big conference like this, so that was really a cool honor for the China Africa project. We have some cool news coming next week. Uh, some really cool announcements. We've been making a lot of upgrades to the service and what we're doing. We're actually growing a little team now. And so we're going to be making some announcements next week. But uh, we, what we've been doing to date is bringing a lot more Chinese coverage. And today in the newsletter, Kobus, it was so interesting to get that perspective from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences because so much of how China expresses itself in English tends to fall into that stiff propaganda language. And then when you look at the Chinese language articles, papers, research reports, think tank analysis – it's so much more nuanced, and we've got some we've got some great help coming into us to translate and contextualize that for our subscribers. That is subscriber only content. We also brought today uh, the only English language coverage out there of a Zimbabwean vice president who we think is Constantino Chiwenga, but not confirmed, who tested positive in a Beijing hotel for COVID nineteen and subsequently led to that hotel going into a mandatory 21-day quarantine, pissing off everybody in the hotel in the neighborhood. So that was really interesting. Again, that's coming from Chinese media and Chinese language media. So that's really exciting. If you like to hear some of that, and this again, this is not the propaganda stuff. This is the really good stuff that you just don't get in the English language press. Go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Copus and I are writing... All of the content on the website every day. We're writing opinion columns, doing news, doing podcasts and all this stuff. And if you want to get it, you got to sign up. It's only $7 a month for students and teachers and $15 a month for everyone else. So that'll do it for this edition 
of the podcast. Copus and I will be back again next week with another show. And then beginning in August, we'll be ramping back up to two shows a week. So we uh, really thank you for giving us a little bit of a breather there. But we'll be, we're really excited coming up in August and leading into FOCAC. So that'll do it. We'll see you again next week. Thanks so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs> <laughs>